Hi, everyone. I think this was my cue. Uh, welcome to a series of fortunate events. My name is Matthias Nobak, uh, but you may pronounce it in, a, in, an, in any other way that vaguely resembles that. Um, you may know me better as a Symphony 2 guy, but since Drupal is about to, or has already embraced Symphony as part of its core, um, it makes sense for me to be here. And I'm talking about events. What are events, really? And this is something I've learned to ask uh, ever since I studied philosophy, actually. Um, you can sound like a very smart person if you ask things like, what are events, really? Uh, and then ask it again, no, but really, what are events? Yes, well, in the case of events, it's really very simple. Events are just things that happen. And what's very interesting about events in particular, especially in this, uh, during this talk, will be that they can trigger actions. Uh, just now, a very practical example, uh, you arrived. And then this finally triggered me to turn on my microphone, which was an event that triggered you to stop talking, actually. And then that particular event triggered me to start talking. So. That is just a series of fortunate events leading to this particular fact of me being here talking to you. And when it comes to events in software, this is more or less the same. Events model what happened inside a system. And also, the, the actions that are triggered by particular events are what happens inside other parts of the same system, and sometimes even what happens in other systems. So within a system, you can respond to events happening somewhere and you can do some things based on that particular event. Most programming out there looks something like this. You will have only a, a long list of commands, basically. Uh, there is the command do this, the command do that, uh, update something, and then finally return something. You will see this again and again. And if we were to uh, introduce the concept of an event in such code, it would only be very easy. We would only have to write uh, some comments like this. Of course, there's no implementation to events at this time, but it's very easy to uh, at least introduce a notion of events. Um, so when the command do this has been executed, really what happened was that the event this was done took place. And the same thing for do that, this, this stands for the event that was done, um, and so on. So it, it can be very easy. This is more of a, um, an everyday code sample that you will find in any project, really. Uh, most projects have some kind of a post or an article. And m most articles and posts can also have comments. Uh, this is what code looks like that tries to add a comment to an existing post. Uh, you provide a post ID and a comment, which is just a string here. Um, you fetch the post from some place, probably the database. You add the comment to the post, and you save the post again and that will basically save the, the comment too. And then after the comment was added, you want to run some code like this, the logger. You want to maybe add a line to the log file saying there was a new comment, and you want to send a mail to people who are interested about this fact. Um, so you want to send, an, send a mail saying there was a new comment. Ex well, something I, I would have to mention here is that in order to send an email uh, and to log a line or add a line to a log file, you would, of course, need uh, a mailer and a logger, which you need to inject using uh, constructor arguments. And then you would be able to do such a thing from inside the post service. Now, to introduce events in a bit more interesting way than just adding comments in place, uh, it would just be as simple as creating a private method probably inside the same class, saying new comment added, and to, to put all the logic that happens after a comment was added right there inside that particular uh, method. By the way, it looks really great to see uh, my code so big on the screen. It's at home, I usually write smaller code, so that's just very nice. Um, well. Just a note about the, the graph of dependencies here. It's, um, the post service needs a logger and a mailer, and this is something we have to keep in mind. It's, it's somehow strange, right? Uh, and this leads to some design issues. I really don't think that the post service should know all about the mailer and the logger. Uh, it, it usually doesn't have anything to do with that kind of a tool. 
And if I would like to change the behavior that happens after a comment was added, I would have to modify the post service class itself, even though the post service is not worried at all about sending mails and uh, writing lines to a log file. So this is something I would really like to change. And uh, I would like to be able to modify that, that behavior without touching the actual class. And well, of course, this talk is about events. So we are going to fix those design issues by introducing events, but only gradually. Um, I will show you several steps that lead eventually towards uh, using events in your software. But there are several other steps that we have to take before that can actually happen. First, I would like to introduce something called the observer pattern, or at least an implementation of that pattern in my code. Um, observer looks something like this. Um, inside a subject, something happens, and several observers are interested in this particular event. So there's already uh, a slight hint of using events. So an observer pattern, or implementing it, allows you to notify other parts of the application when something changes or some, something happens that, is, that might be interesting to others. Uh, it looks very simple. You have an array or a list of observers. And each observer, you call uh, its method notify. And then you, you uh, let, let, it, let it go. You know, the, the observer is allowed to handle its own logic. Um, the observer contract is actually very simple. It only has this notify method. And it's all, it's, it's all there, there is to it. Um, just let's take a look at some very concrete observers, like the logging observer in our case. Uh, when notified of the fact that, that a comment was added, it is allowed to uh, add a line to the log file using, using uh, the logger. And uh, as you can see, it only gets the logger injected as a constructor argument here. And then when notified, it will log a message saying there is a new comment. And another very concrete observer is the notification mail observer. It has only one task to send an email when a new comment was added. And of course, it uses the mailer uh, for that, uh, which is injected as a constructor argument. Now, we have moved some logic from the post service to another class, uh, two classes, actually. And we have to make that logic available inside the post service. And we do that by uh, constructor injection again. We provide just an array of those observer objects. Um, we inject it in, into the post service. And then, well, this is called configuration, since we are going to do this outside of the post service. And maybe we use some kind of a dependency injection tool, like uh, the Symfony service container, uh, to actually take care of this for us. Now, before, we had this very nice dependency graph, but not really very nice, since we wanted to move those dependencies out. Uh, the post service depended immediately or directly on the logger and the mailer. And now afterwards, the post service depends on uh, an unknown number of observers, which is a very abstract thing. And there are two concrete things, the logging observer and the notification mail observer. And each has very specific tasks and use different dependencies, like a logger and a mailer. So there's no dependency on the logger and the mailer anymore from inside the post service, which is really great. So now it's time to have this little design principles party here, since we have applied uh, three, at least three of the um, solid design principles that you may have already heard of. Um, I will explain them quickly to you. Uh, we have, on the fly, so to say, applied the single responsibility principle here. Uh, the principle says that each class should have one small, well-defined responsibility and nothing more. Um, basically, uh, let's take a look at, at the, the different classes and what their responsibilities are currently. The post service, its only responsibility is to add comments to posts, which it does very well. Um, the logging observer, its only responsibility is to write a line to the log file. And the same for the notification mail observer, it only has to send an email, which is a very small, well-defined responsibility. And the other side of this single responsibility principle is that whenever a change is necessary, it only has to happen in one place, or it only has to occur in one small part of the application. Um, for instance, when someone walks in and says, well, we have to capitalize all the comments that um, have to be added to posts, we immediately open the post service class and modify some code there. And then if someone walks in and says, we are going to use a different logger, uh, we are going to mo use monolog, for instance, or uh, maybe even uh, the PSR3 uh, um, global logger interface. Now, then, of course, you have, to, you have to modify code in the logger observer. You don't have to modify code in the post service for that, just the logger observer. And the same goes for the notification mail observer, since 
it knows all about sending emails and uh, what is going to be inside the message. Uh, and so if someone asks you to add a timestamp to the mail, yes, you can easily do so. The second principle that we, well, knowingly or unknowingly applied here is the dependency inversion principle. And it basically says that you have to depend on abstractions, not on concretions. And you already heard me uh, use that, that, that word, uh, abstract and concrete. Um, what happened in the beginning, post service depended on something very concrete. It was a tool like a logger and a mailer uh, with very concrete implementation details. Just like we saw in the dependency graph. <clears throat> but now it depends actually on something very abstract, an observer, which uh, really um, tells nothing about what's going on inside the, the code of the observer. So instead of depending on concrete things, we are going to, we have been depending on uh, abstract things, like you see in this nice little diagram. There is nothing concrete about any of those observers. So um, the, the only things that are concrete which are depended upon by other classes are the mailer and the logger. And those are depended upon by very concrete classes themselves, like the logging observer and the mailing observer, as you can see in this part of the diagram. <clears throat> well, the last of the principles that we applied here is the open-close principle, which is quite, I think, quite a famous principle. Um, a class should be open for extension and closed for modi modification. Um, we, we really applied this principle here since uh, you don't need to modify um, a class anymore to change the behavior. So if we want to change the behavior that, ha that, that happens after a comment was added, we don't need to modify the post service class anymore. We can just switch out some, some observers. Like in this diagram, uh, <clears throat> you, can, you can switch observer, uh, the second observer and use another observer there. You can maybe even leave out the first observer or add another observer. And for all of these behavioral changes, you don't have to modify post service at all. That's really great. So we made the post service class closed for modification. There's almost no need anymore to modify code inside the class. And we have made it open for extension. Well, this is a very famous event that happens in many houses all over the world. <clears throat> Mr. Body was murdered. Uh, who recognizes this image, by the way? Yes, well, quite a few people. That's great. Um, <clears throat> well, th this part is about event data. And, well, we don't have any data about an event currently. But we would, of course, like to know a little bit more about when uh, and, and why a particular event occurred. So when you say, oh, Mr. Body was murdered, you would definitely like to know who did it, really. Uh, well, Mrs. Peacock did, which you all may remember. Um, where did it happen? Well, in the dining room, yes. And how did it happen, since we want the gory details? With a candlestick, yes. And it must have not been a pleasant experience. But if we look at our own implementation of events currently, we don't have anything like that. So we are not able to, to, to know anything about the event that happened inside one of the observers. So as you can see, when we are notified, we have no, no clue about the context in which the event occurs, uh, occurred. So, and yes, I would li really like to be more specific about uh, which comment was added, to which post it was added, when really. Um, so I need more information, and I'll, I want to log more details at this, uh, in this particular observer. So le let's introduce an event object. It's very simple. We have a, a class which is just uh, some kind of a value holder. So you may, may provide it using constructor arguments, in this case the post ID and the comment, but it may just as well be some public uh, properties. Uh, it's, it, it can be just very easy. Uh, as you can see in this case, I, I wrap those inside uh, in some public methods, uh, comment and post ID in order to be able to later retrieve the actual post that the comment was added to and which comment really was added. What this does is it stores the context of an event that happened. So whenever an event occurs, we create such an object and we provide the, 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 the information that was currently available at that time. And, well, since we want to pass that information to the observers, we have to change our interface here. Um, so let's, let's, let's leave the observer part behind and <clears throat> implement command or um, uh, event handlers. And this is the interface. It looks like this. It has a, a handle method instead of a notify method. 
and um, it provides the event object as an argument. And now all of the event handlers may, may use the event object if they like. Or, the, or they can just be simple observers just doing something after they are notified of an event. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a rework of our existing, well, then it was called observer, but now it's called event handler. And uh, basically it does almost the same, but now it has the right data about when the event happened and why, uh, in what context. The same goes for the notification mail observer or handler. Uh, it now implements the same interface and it does more or less the same, but it uses data from the actual event object. <coughs> Again, some configuration is needed to get this all working. Um, instead of providing an array of observers, we provide an array of event handlers, which is more or less the same. Um, but still, there is some configuration going on outside of the post service class. And just in the same way as we looped over observers, we are going to, to loop over event handlers. But right before we do so, we have to instantiate our event object, which is an instance of command edit event. And we just have to provide the right arguments to its constructor, and then it will already work. So this allows us to push some information to the actual handlers, or observers as they were. Well, let's take it this a little, uh, uh, one step further. Um, we introduce a mediator, which is another design pattern. I al already mentioned observer is a pattern. Uh, these are some, some patterns from the design pattern book, elements of reusable object-oriented software. I will uh, add a slide, or I have added a slide about this book at the end. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to read the book and um, well, learn some of the, 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 the very common commonly used design patterns, since you will recognize them all over the place used in very famous projects. Well, we are going to introduce a mediator, which is really a simple design pattern, um, uh, although <laughs> mediators sometimes cost a lot of money. But um, we are going to leave the talking between the objects to a mediator. And, <clears throat> well, there are some famous mediators out there. Uh, the Doctrine uh, Library and the Send Framework both have an event manager, which is basically a mediator for events. Then there is another one which I find quite nice. It's the, the, um, the event emitter created by the PHP League. And Symfony has its own <coughs> event manager or event mediator. It's called the event dispatcher. And yes, since we have such a close relationship nowadays, um, well, I, I am going to talk here about the Symfony event dispatcher, of course. So before, this was the situation. The post service called um, each of the event handlers uh, directly. So it called the logging event handler and it called the notification mail event handler. Um, and now afterwards, we are going to leave the talking to the event dispatcher, which we put in between the post service and the handlers. And in code, this would look something like this. We inject an event dispatcher as a constructor argument, and then later we uh, create the same kind of objects, uh, the command edit event, um, and we dispatch the event to it. Uh, we say, just handle this event. I don't care how you do it. Um, well, just figure it out. So we add a little string, which is the name of the event that occurred, and it will later allow the dispatcher to find which listeners or handlers it should notify. And then, of course, we also provide the event object uh, to add a little context to this particular event. If you're going to use the Symfony event dispatcher for this, you have to extend the Symfony event class. But that's not really a problem unless you really care about uh, coupling, like I do. But, well, okay, for this, in this particular case, I let it here. Um, yeah, so this is just one thing you have to do. You have to use the event class and extend your event object from it, or event class from it. Then you need to have an, a little layer of configuration. So you instantiate the event dispatcher, which is just a very simple class. It doesn't need any constructor arguments. And then you instantiate all of your event handlers, which uh, Symfony would call, or the Symfony community would call event listeners, by the way. Um, so on the, the dispatcher, you call the add listener method, and you add instances of the event handlers or the event listeners. Um, again, you will see here the use of the string comment underscore edit, which is the name of the event, and the dispatcher will know how to find which event, event listeners to call. Then the second argument is an array of the object and the method that the dispatcher should, should call, 
whenever the event occurs. So then you can instantiate the post service and you will have a post service object with the dispatcher inside of it. Really nice. Uh, yes, well, as I said, Symfony 2, Drupal um, 8, it's a good, uh, it's a good match. Um, and when you, want to, when, to, when you want to use events in your application, it will be very easy since the event underscore dispatcher service is already available, which is an instance of the event dispatcher. Uh, so you can use it right away and inject it inside your services. Then you can also register your event listeners very easily using service tags. And uh, just a quick uh, hands up, like how many of you have used um, the Symfony services YAML? Define some services for Drupal 8. Yes. Well, quite some people. Yes. Um, so this is a really great way to uh, uh, to prepare your objects to be used. So you can just. Uh, oh, I, I have some slides about it. Um, this is the way service configuration looks like. Um, you have a post service, uh, which is defined by post underscore service. It's just the name of the service. You provide the the full class name of it. And then you say it needs these arguments. And the arguments themselves can, can be anything, but, uh, or not really anything, but many things. Um, and, uh, but in the first place, they can be uh, other services too. So you have this little at, and then you write the name of another service that should be injected as a constructor argument. And that's very easy, since the event dispatcher is already defined as a service, you can use it in your own classes, which is great. If you have event listeners or event handlers, you can easily register them using a service tag. And this is what a service tag looks like. You create a service. It, it is called logging event handler. Uh, you provide, again, a class and some arguments. Also, a logger is already available in Symfony 2, so you can just use that one. And then uh, the tag looks something like this. There is a name, kernel.event underscore listener. Um, you provide the name of the event uh, to which this listener is going to listen. And then you mention the name of the method that should be called on that object once the event occurs. So it's really very easy. Uh, you can start using it immediately in your projects. And the interesting thing is that uh, Symfony, as well as Drupal, have fully embraced the concept of events in their application. So when uh, a request comes in in a Symfony 2 application and a response is about to be generated for it, um, this all happens using events and event listeners partly by event listeners of the framework itself, and partly by uh, user edit event listeners. I will just give you a quick overview of what Symfony does under the hood when it tries to create a response. Um, and this is equally true for uh, Drupal itself. And um, they, will, they have added some extra events to it, but it's, it's, it's really more or less the same. If you look in the index.php file for Drupal projects or Drupal 8 projects, you will see something like this. A request is being generated from uh, the super globals like uh, underscore post, underscore get, uh, underscore server, cookies, files, anything. Um, and then this request object is, is, uh, is provided as an argument to the handle method of the kernel. Uh, the kernel does really all the work. And uh, on its way, it fires lots of, or it dispatches lots of events. and the end result of all those events adds up to um, the actual response that should be returned to the client. And so the response object is the, the return value of the handle method, and the response can be sent to the client. So just a quick overview of uh, those kernel events. The first one is kernel.request, and it allows event listeners to do some route matching, for instance. Um, the, the, the URI will be, will, will be uh, looked at, and it will try to be uh, matched with uh, existing routes in the application. And then uh, the resulting controller will, will, will be used in the, in the step afterwards, after this one. Um, also, kernel.request is an excellent uh, time to do some authentication checks. For instance, um, this is uh, also the way the Symfony security component itself does it. But this allows any further execution of the, um, the, the usual flow. So you can, you can break in and return a response right there. And you can say, in that response, you can say you are not allowed to be here or something like that. Then <clears throat> the, the next interesting event would be kernel.controller. It allows you basically to replace any controller that was previously matched. Uh, so again, you, could, you can do something like uh, preventing access to uh, the current controller. Uh, but you can also do some other stuff that needs to be done uh, before executing any controller, like maybe checking some access 
related things. Then the controller should return a, an actual response object. At least that is the symphony philosophy. But in most situations, it doesn't. So uh, for instance, uh, in Drupal 8, <clears throat> you will always return an array, I think. Um, well, uh, that array will, of course, be used to render a template. And um, yes, the kernel.view event allows event listeners to hook into this process and determine how to convert an actual return value of a controller to a true response object. So yes, in most cases, it's just render a template. But in other cases, it may also be uh, convert the returned uh, value from the controller to a, a maybe a JSON uh, response uh, for an API or something. The, the last event that I am going to, or no, no, almost last, uh, that I'm going to uh, explain here is the kernel.response event. And it can be used to modify the, the actual response object uh, at, at, the, at the last moment that's possible. So right before sending the response back, you will uh, back to the client, or not even back to the client, but to the client, you are allowed to modify the, um, the content of the response, maybe add some headers to it, um, Symphony itself injects the, its toolbar, maybe you've seen it before, um, right at this time, whenever the response is an HTML response. Um, so this is, this is also um, <clears throat> used to add some cookies maybe, or, um, well, remove some cookies if that is necessary. And then kernel.exception is used whenever any part of the application throws an exception. And uh, it is used to ask uh, one of the event listeners to generate a response for such a, an exceptional situation. So <clears throat> maybe you want to respond in a particular way to a user when a particular exception occurs. Uh, the, the, the most general way to handle a, an exception, of course, is to render a nice page with um, a friendly uh, little fellow with three, three fingers, I guess, um, and the stack trace if you're in development mode. What's quite fascinating is that Symfony uses events um, not in a very traditional way, but in a, well, maybe a modern way. Uh, it allows event listeners to talk back to the one who has dispatched the events. So kernel events are not merely notifications. Uh, it's not, they are not meant for other parts of the application to be notified of something. They are meant for other parts of the application to be actively involved in some step of the process. So they are, they are allowed to modify uh, well, parts of the application or parts of uh, the process by maybe returning a response early or modifying an existing response, overriding a controller. And these are all very um, active things to do for event listeners. So in the previous parts of this talk, it was all about uh, being notified, uh, doing something when something else occurs. But now it's really like talking back to each other. And this very much reminds us of um, the chain of responsibility pattern, which is also from that famous design patterns book, it looks something like this. There is some sort of request, not even an HTTP request, but any kind of request. And there are, are uh, several uh, handlers, like handler one, two, three. Each of them is asked to handle the request. But handler one, it doesn't know how to, uh, what to do with this particular request. So it lets handler two do the, do the work. Uh, well, yes, handler2 knows something about it, uh, about this, and it creates a response, which is actually used as the response for this particular request. Handler3 will not be called in most situations. So that's that. When transposed to the Symphony world, it would look something like this. You have event listeners, one, two, three. You have uh, a particular event or a request, like I've got an exception, uh, says Symphony, what should I tell the user? Now, listener one tries to do something with it, but it doesn't know how to handle exceptions. So, well, yes, listener two. Uh, well, l listener two, in fact, knows how to handle this exception, and it generates a response. And now listener three will never be called. So you might wonder, um, sorry, <clears throat> you might wonder, how can I uh, influence this process? Since if I am listener three, uh, uh, well, maybe uh, someone else uh, handles this request, and I never get the chance to do so. Um, the Symphony Event Dispatcher offers several ways to influence the chain of uh, responsibility here. Uh, it also uh, handle, allows you to, um, well, prevent other listeners from uh, picking up this request. One way to do it is 
well, for instance, if I if I set uh, the response on something, I can say uh, stop propagation right there. Uh, and um, well, I, this way I particularly uh, prevent other event listeners to handle this request. So that's great. Maybe this is the best response ever. Another way to, um, <clears throat> to influence the chain of responsibility is to use priorities. Whenever I add a listener to the dispatcher manually, and also with uh, the service tags I mentioned before, you can also provide a priority, which is an integer. It can be a negative number. Uh, you, by default, it's zero. But this way, you can uh, modify the, the, the priority of or the prior, prior, prioritization <laughs> of all the uh, listeners in, in the row. So when you use a priority of 1,000, maybe, um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, I think the limit will be PHP in max of so, um, then you will always be the first, and you can stop any propagation of that particular event. So that's great. Now, well, you may have some concerns, um, or at least I do, when I look at uh, events, uh, at code that uses events. And in particular, if you're not used to using events in your code, um, introducing an event dispatcher may seem really strange. <clears throat> and there are several concerns that I like to uh, address here, and I hope I can convince you to either uh, step over it or, uh, well, maybe do something about it. And the first concern is that events, or uh, the way events are handled, can be very difficult to understand. So, um, well, I really think this is Partly true, since this type of understanding I call click-through understanding. So if you are, you are working in an editor which uh, shows you some links to uh, maybe methods and where are uh, variables defined and in which file is this class defined, um, then yes, it will be hard to understand event handling. Uh, since whenever you uh, encounter an event dispatcher in Symfony code and you click on the dispatch method to see what's happening inside that method, you will see something like this. It just points to the interface. And there's no clue about a particular implementation of um, uh, event listeners there, or you may never know what happens um, <coughs> behind the scenes. Well, this is a very easy solution. You just have to install Xdebug on your machine, uh, if you didn't already have that, uh, since that will basically allow you to step through the process when, uh, when the application is running. So you don't need to click through anymore uh, to uh, where a method is defined or uh, where you really expect the code to be. Anything can be different at runtime. So you have to have something like this, an interactive debugger, where you, could, where you can step through the code while it is being executed, step by step. So then you will see what is the value of any current variable uh, that is used and uh, where did this current um, line, or what is the, what is, well, really, what is, this, what is the, 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 the stack, stack trace? So you can see where you come from. Um, well, this, this may seem a bit not really a solution, <laughs> but it is. Uh, I think most, most of the, 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 the modern code nowadays, like, like Symfony 2 is, is, in my opinion, quite modern code, um, works with uh, interfaces a lot. And then you, you are never able to click through to the actual implementation. This only works with concrete classes, right? So. One, I think, bigger concern would be that, that you have some out-of-domain concepts in your code. Like, if, if we looked at the original post-service uh, class, we saw things like uh, a comment, which was uh, a string, but, all right, a post ID, which is the identifier of a particular post. Uh, we saw a method add comment to post. And then all of a sudden, we introduced this strange word, dispatcher which has nothing to do in the domain of uh, adding comments to posts. That's, that's re that really doesn't sound like something that you would usually use when you're adding comments to posts. So that's really strange. Um, and while we did a good thing, actually, we, we fixed some very, very uh, bad coupling issues since we, we used a mailer and a logger directly inside the post service. Um, yes, well, let, let me just tell you the other part of the story. Uh, this is uh, Konstantin Kudrashov, a great name, I think. I, I hope I pronounce it well. Uh, also known as Everzet. Um, I, I went to a talk. Um, at, he, he, he did a talk at Symphony Live last week. Um, he had some great words to say about this. So let me just show you what he said. This guy, 
coupling as a sister. Uh, so even though we are fixing coupling issues here, uh, well, this sister, <laughs> she's called cohesion. And well, she is important too. And she also has her own ideas about uh, what should happen to the code in your class. Uh, cohesion really is about um, uh, a sense of belonging together. So when you look at, at code, I think most of you have said one time or probably many times, um, hey, well, listen, this method doesn't belong inside this class. It's just, it just doesn't belong there. It's about a different concept or it, 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 it doesn't feel right. Um, or maybe even, what is this variable about? It doesn't make sense in this context. Uh, and this is what cohesion is about. It, it is about belonging together. And the thing is, in most code or most domains, dispatcher, event listener, and even event, um, they, they shouldn't be there. They are just words that have nothing to do with the actual problem domain of adding comments to posts in our case. So yes, <coughs> more difficult of a problem, but there are very easy solutions. Uh, the, the first thing you can do is have better naming in your code. So instead of writing things like notification mail event listener, uh, such a class should be named send notification mail when comment added. And this already makes a lot more sense to anybody who would like, who would look at the code and so try to, uh, tries to understand what's happening, even if they, they wouldn't know about event listeners. Then a comment added event, it doesn't really mean anything. You should write something like comment added, which already uh, explains about itself that it is some kind of event. It, do, it just happened. And something like on comment edit, which reminds us more like uh, more of uh, jQuery development, uh, should definitely be something like when comment edit. And this is something you can explain to anybody. Uh, just write the code, the code out loud and everybody will understand. If you use things like event listener, event, or uh, on as a, as a method name, that, that, that doesn't make sense to most people. Only if you know about event listeners, of course. And so basically, this also hides implementation details. Um, I, I think most people will not worry about uh, whether you're using a Symfony Event Dispatcher or uh, the Doctrine, Zen, or the, the doctrine uh, Event Manager. Um, you should just hide the fact that you do such a, such a thing. Um, and it should be just plain by looking at the code what the code is doing. Another solution is to not use an Event Dispatcher. And I tend to not use it when uh, or I tend to only use it when um, uh, things are not naturally cohesive anyway. So, for instance, the mailer and the logger in the post service class, they, they showed no cohesion at first. So uh, mailing and logging has nothing to do with adding comments to posts. So th these things were naturally uncohesive, and we could easily move them out to event listeners. There's no problem in that. Uh, but, well, if there is natural cohesion, you'd better not introduce an event dispatcher, um, which would cause low cohesion. But you have to use something else. You may uh, use observers there, or you may any other objects that, that, that just collaborates with uh, the object you're currently talking about. For instance, when you look at the code, uh, the symphony code uh, for resolving the controller, uh, you will see something like, something like this. There is the event get response event, or something like that. Uh, you provide the request as a constructor argument, and then uh, the dispatcher is used to dispatch the kernel.request event. Um, and any listener is allowed to populate the request attribute underscore controller. Well, this is, this is some magic going on. Um, but it's, it's really very, uh, it has low cohesion, since many of the concepts used inside this piece of code uh, don't clearly communicate what is actually going on. Um, maybe I would have expected something like this. So controller is controller resolver resolve. And of course, you may use the request. But in the end, I just want to get a controller from this. And I don't want to, to use a dispatcher. It's just totally unclear what happens in all the event listeners. So yes, well, there are several alter alternatives. Uh, you could just as well uh, use observers like we did in the first few slides of this presentation. A third con uh, concern, which is also important, and somewhat profound, <laughs> is that you feel um, that you lose control in a way. Um, well, you know, you, you are relying on event listeners to, to do some very important work. It's not like you can just disable an event listener and your application will work, uh, will still work as it did before. No, event listeners are very important. 
Um, yet, how do you know if they are in place and well configured and uh, that they do their job, that they are supposed to do? Um, yes, well, one thing, of course, you can or you should have some kind of a test that shows that the, all those event listeners work. But even still, um, this is not really a solution or there, there isn't going to be a solution since uh, let's, let's label this a won't fix. Um, you have to really learn to live with this kind of uh, loss of control. This happens all the time and it's good. Ah yes, so I, I, had, a, I had one slide saying it's good. <coughs> Which is a good slide, by the way. Um, well, what, what this is called, this loss of control, is actually called inversion of control. So there's no real loss of control, it's just that this particular class, the post service in, in our case, uh, doesn't have control about what happens after a comment was added. And that's really good. It looks something like this. Um, first, we have a thing that exercises control. Yes, it, ex ex it exercises control over the other thing. Um, and then, well, just we give up control and there's no, no relationship even with that first thing and the second thing. You, of course, know all about inversion of control um, since, well, yes, a router determines the right controller for you. There's no, no way that from inside the controller you have, to, you have to say, yes, yes, choose me or something. That, that doesn't happen. It all happens outside of the controller. Um, also, the service container, at least the, the Symphony one, injects the right constructor arguments. That is also inversion of control. You leave that part of control that you would usually exercise yourself by instantiating any objects you need right where you need them to uh, something outside of your class, like the service container. Well, just a, a little everyday example of um, uh, inversion of control. When you die, uh, someone will bury your body for you. It, it's not, not that you have to do something for that. You just leave it to others. So it's just all the same. But <laughs> just like John Nash, or I don't know if the, if the real person said this, but uh, at least he does uh, in the movie, I'm, I must admit that I'm also terrified, mortified, petrified, stupefied by inversion of control. You know, it's, it's really scary to, to give up so much control and let it all be handled by things outside of your own classes. But it's really the best way of doing things. It will lead to better design, which is good anyway, it, it doesn't need any, any explanation. It will require less change since uh, every little class has its own responsibility like we saw before. Um, and that will in fact make maintenance much easier. Just by looking at the names of the classes, everything will be clear and any future maintainer, if it isn't you or, or it is you, uh, will be able to, to quickly find where he's supposed to um, modify some code. Yes, that is, that is just good. At this moment, my presentation is somewhat finished. Um, I always learned to ask questions when presentation finished. So I don't know if there is a, a microphone uh, available to um, just have some, yes? Oh, you can just move to the front and say anything you like to me. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just going to count to 30 in my head until someone comes up. <laughs> That's really hard. <laughs> hmm. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this was the other. Thank you, were no more questions. Um, well, just some commercial messages uh, towards the end of this, this, uh, this talk. I wrote this book. It, all, it is uh, very much about Symfony, um, but it's very, very interesting to Drupal 8 developers. Um, it contains lots of information about how you can create service definitions, um, all about those particular kernel events that lead eventually to the actual response. And because you're DrupalCon, I have created a special discount uh, for this book. Uh, when you download the slides, uh, just check out Twitter uh, later, or already, you can already download the slides on Twitter. Um, well, you can just click that link and you will get the discount. Also, if you're interested in package design, <laughs> about which I'm writing a second book, um, well, just take a look at it. Uh, maybe it interests you and maybe it, 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 well, maybe it doesn't say anything to you. No problem at all. Uh, I just wanted to quickly mention this. 
Then there is this book, Design Patterns, which I also uh, mentioned sometime. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't write this book, of course. Uh, it is the famous gang of four, starting with Eric Gamma and all the other names I always forget. Uh, lucky Eric Gamma, of course. Uh, it contains explanations of all the design patterns like observer, mediator, chain of responsibility, and so many more. Then this book, Solid Principles, uh, or it's not called Solid Principles, it's called Agile Software Development. It's by another big name in the industry, Robert Martin. And he uh, explained all about uh, what he calls the solid principles. And these principles are very widely known uh, and are very useful uh, any day you're writing code. So just get it. Uh, yes, some images I used. Uh, I, I especially liked uh, DiCaprio. And um, well, I, of course, I'd like to know what do you think? What did you think about this um, information I gave you? Uh, how did I do? Did I wait too long? or? <laughs> Too short uh, to ask some questions. Never mind. Um, well, you can find me on Twitter too. And um, well, then this this was really it. So thank you again. <laughs>